uh, a guest. If you're a visitor, you've not been here very many times, we just want to say welcome. We are so glad that you're here worshiping with us today. If you're online, watching online, uh, welcome. We're glad that you have tuned in. We hope that you're able to join us sometime in person. We would we'd love to see you here. If you're a faithful, regular attender at Brookhaven, thank you so much for your faithfulness, your faithfulness and commitment to this community of faith uh, is, is so important to us, and we are, we are glad that you're here today. Uh, I have a picture, uh, but well, before we do that, before we do that, uh, let's just make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we have, in January, we've been in this series of teachings called CORE. It is a series that we do every year, and it is a series where we really focus on the vision and the mission that God has called us to. Uh, the first week, we talked about the fact that God, God has called us to be a place of truth. A place where the truth of God's word transforms our lives. A place where we are able to, to not just proclaim the truth to the world, which is important, but also we live it out within our lives and it transforms us. The second week we talked about being a place of grace, that God has called us to be a community of faith that knows what it is to demonstrate grace to the world. That, that we offer them the truth, we give them the truth, but we do it in a spirit of grace and of love so that people know uh, know the love of Jesus Christ within their life. Last week, we talked about being a place uh, where all hands are on deck. Today, we're going to finish up this series. And, uh, but before we do, I have a picture I want to show you. Now, does anybody know uh, where, where this is? This is, a, this is Rock City in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's an awesome place. And uh, if you cannot see it because of the glare, uh, it says C7 states. And so you get to this point in Rock City where you can look at, and there's seven different states that you can see. It's, it's an awesome place. And, um, but you cannot see it from, from the car. I mean, in the car, you're not going to see the seven states. You cannot see it in the gift shops. If you're in the gift shops, or uh, if you're having pizza in the restaurant, you're not going to be all able to see all seven states. You have to go to this point, this lookout point. You have to look out, and in that moment, you're able on a clear day to see seven different states. It's really cool. I had the opportunity. I, I, I was there when I was a kid, but during my sabbatical uh, this past summer, I had an opportunity to go there again, and, and we just absolutely loved it. And um, they also have... Um, these, these things, these binocular things that they have, it looks like a person, we, we tried to name ours, I think, and, um, and if you put the quarter in it, uh, most times it works, in some places you go, these things are like, they don't work, and they just took a quarter, but sorry about that, um, but you can look in them, and, and it really does an amazing job just magnifying things. I mean, we looked over the valley, and, and we saw parking lots, and we could see details in, in cars, we could see buildings. It was just an, an amazing, ex, amazing experience, and, and we loved it. Today, uh, we're talking about what it means to have a greater for those people who do not yet know Jesus Christ. Um, we talk about this often, this idea that God has called us to be a place where we see hundreds, if not thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ, not only come to know him, but be discipled and the devoted followers of him who follow him uh, just with all their lives, surrender their lives completely to him. There, uh, there's 40,000 people, around 40,000 people in Grant County that claim no religious affiliation, not just that they go to church on Easter and, um, and Christmas, but they actually claim no religious affiliation. In other words, they probably don't even do that. There are three million Hoosiers, three million people in Indiana who claim absolutely no religious affiliation. As a church, as a church, we have been talking about, we've been working through, what would it mean for us to have this greater vision, this, this ability to see people the way Christ sees people, so that we can see hundreds if not thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ. Today, um, this, uh, Lainey and Dana read a story, uh, a part of a story about Jesus meeting this woman at, at a well. And, uh, and so this morning, we're going to unpack that a little bit. We're going to unpack the story because there's so many things that we see in this story that I think is important for us to, to wrestle with as we talk about this idea of seeing people come to know Jesus. One of the things I think we must understand is that um, 
This is not Brookhaven's mission. This idea of seeing people come to know Jesus Christ, this is not Brookhaven's mission or vision. This is God's mission. I, I was reminded in the story, I was intrigued by the story. His disciples, um, they go to get him some food, and they come back, and, and they're asking him if, if he wants to eat. And Jesus uh, seems to decline, and he says, my nourishment, we, we read this in, in the scripture that was written, my nourishment is to do the will of my Father who sent me. Jesus is saying that, that what, what, what fulfills me, what I'm called to do, it, is not mere food, but it is to do the will of the, of the Father who sent me. What was Jesus doing in this moment? He was talking to this lady about what it means to worship God, what it, what it means about the Messiah. He was having this conversation, and he says to his disciples, this is what I am called to do. I am called to, to tell the message of hope to this, to this person. Uh, can I just say this, that um, from the beginning of time, God has been working, he has been working in, in human interactions to bring people back to him, to reconcile uh, the world to himself. That is what God has been doing from the beginning of time. And so Jesus says, I, I have a, a nourishment that you don't even know about. It's to do the will of my Father who sent me. Jesus is saying, like my Father, like God the Father, I am working to reconcile the world to myself. We see this unfold. We, we see in, in the early parts of Scripture where Adam and Eve sin. And what does God do? He immediately, he immediately finds a way to offer them an atonement for their sin. We see um, this taking place in Abraham. His name was Abram, and God calls him out. And he makes a nation out of him. And, and that nation that God established in Abraham, the, the Hebrew people, was not just a nation for itself. But it was a nation whose purposes was to be able to, to bring about reconciliation with the entire world. In fact, in Isaiah chapter, uh, in, in Isaiah we read, it's in chapter, let me make sure I get my re right reference here. In, in Isaiah chapter 49. Uh, we read this. He says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles, and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And so, so the prophet was saying, this, this people that God has called out, this was not just a people for themselves. This is a people that was, in, that, that was in God's big plan to reconcile the world to himself. Fast forward to the New Testament. We see God doing the same thing through Jesus. And, and, and as Jesus is getting ready to go back to heaven, he sends out his disciples and all of us who follow. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So, so Jesus says to his followers, you have been given God's mission, which is to reconcile people to me, to play your part in this reconciliation process. Even as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about all the times, I, honestly, I've said it wrong. I, I've said, you know, our, our mission, our vision as a church is to see hundreds, if not thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ and be devoted followers of, of him. And, and that's only partially true because it's not really our mission. It's God's mission. We are actually joining what God has been about from the very beginning of time. July 1969, Neil Armstrong, along with a couple other astronauts on Apollo 11, uh, make the first moon landing. But it was not Armstrong's mission. Armstrong did not say, you know what, I think I'll go to the moon. No, it was NASA's mission. It was, it was the government's mission. And so when we engage in this process, it's not our mission. When I when, it, when I talk about seeing hundreds, if not thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ, that's not my mission. It's not just something I made up. This is what God has called us to do. He actually wants to see the whole world come to him. This is what God is being about. As I look at this story, what I begin to see, though, is that um, Jesus looked at this woman differently than what everyone else looked at Look at this woman differently than what everyone else looked at her. And, and if we truly, 
If we truly want to be a people, see people come to know Jesus Christ, we have to begin to see the world differently. We have to begin to see people through his eyes. We have to allow the Holy Spirit into our life to let us see the world as he sees the world. I love the, the passage of scripture, Matthew chapter 9. Uh, Jesus has been ministering and he says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus looks at the crowd and he, he has compassion on them. He sees them as sheep without a shepherd. Um, these have been people who have been following him. He had, he had fed them and, and he had interacted with them. He had healed their sick and and, and all kinds of things. And Jesus could have looked at this big crowd. And, and he could have seen a lot of things. He could, maybe he could have seen. Maybe he could have seen people who were just taken from him. Or, or maybe he could have seen people who were just expecting things from him. There's a lot of things he could have processed. But he looks out upon them. And he sees them like sheep without a shepherd. And he has compassion on them. And we must be people who see people different. I, I, I think of this story. Jesus talks to this woman, and, and then she goes into town, and she says, come and see a man who told me everything I did. Now, for us, that seems a little creepy, let's just be honest, right? I mean, like, this sounds like a great case of Facebook stalking, or, or maybe the FBI, I have no idea, you know, I don't know exactly what, what we would think, but this woman sees it differently. I, I think the reason why she sees it differently is um, she sees that this is an individual has understood her story. Um, you see, we all long to be known. We all long, it's, a, it's a human spirit within us that, that longs to be known, to longs to be seen. And Jesus sees her. If we want to see people come to know Jesus Christ, we have to learn to see people the way Jesus sees them. There's a... Um, there's an old adage that most of you have heard. Uh, it says, uh, sometimes we can't see the, the, the forest for the trees. That's the way it goes. We, sometimes we cannot see the forest for the trees. And I Googled it because that's where you find out all information like that. What that really means is, is that uh, sometimes we cannot see the big picture because all we see is uh, the details of the, of the situation. And we can't really see the, the big thing that's happening. We're all we're kind of stuck in the minutia of what is taking place. And so we cannot see the forest for the trees. I was thinking that when we talk about what it means to reach people for Jesus, maybe we need to, to be honest and say that sometimes we cannot see the trees for the forest. In other words, we see a forest and it looks big, it looks massive. And we see large groups of people. We think about the 30 or 40,000 people who do not yet know Jesus Christ. And when we look at them, it seems so massive. It seems so big. It seems like such a crowd. But Jesus says, I want you to be able to see the trees. I want you to be able to see the individual people. In fact, um, there's this picture of, of, of a tree that, that came across this this tree is, is unique. It has a story. It has a history. It has uh, lots of things about it that make me ask why. It is its own unique thing. As I think about people. I, I think about people and I begin to see them not in the masses, but I begin to see them in the individual people that they are, like, like this picture that we have right here. This, this one lady who is highlighted in this picture, she has her own story. She has her own history. She has her own family situation. She has her own struggles. She has her own disappointments. She has her own sorrows. She, she rejoices over her own things. And Jesus has a conversation with this woman. And he says, come and see a man who about the fact that Jesus had sought her but, but he knew her he, he cared about the, the, the parts about her life that were unique and interesting if we want to have a greater vision for those people who do not yet know Jesus we have to learn to, to stop and listen to their stories 
We have to listen to their hearts as they break for, for struggles that they have, have had. Or we have to listen to those rejoicing when they rejoice about things that are taking place. We have to learn to actually immerse ourselves into the stories of people's lives. Because it is in those moments when we immerse ourselves in people's story, we actually are able to see people more clearly. Them the way We want to see people come to know Jesus Christ, to be devoted followers of him. Uh, we have to stop looking at the masses of people that need to know Jesus, and we need to say, who is God calling me to? 40,000 people is, is a huge number of people who, in the great county who do not know Jesus Christ. What if each one of us in this room brought one? What if each one of us in this room discipled one into a devoted follower of Jesus Christ? Imagine that. People, the way that Jesus sees them. Something else that takes place, and that is Jesus begins to break down the barriers of who could be accepted into the kingdom. Faith, um, when, when God established the Jewish faith back with Abraham, um, there was this way within the Jewish faith where um, people could come into the faith that, that God fears, as they would often call it. Uh, we see this with Rahab in the Old Testament. She gets absorbed into the Jewish community of faith. And so there was this way um, for people to come into the faith community, but it was a very closed, uh, tightly controlled uh, path, you might say. I mean, they had to clean up a lot of stuff. They had to change a lot of things and, and before they could even have a chance to be welcomed into the community. And, and Jesus begins to rip apart some of that, that understanding. And he is talking to a Samaritan. If you look back up in chapter 4, earlier in chapter 4, you see that Jesus is talking to Samaritans. Samaritans and Jewish people, there was no love lost between the two of them. It was mutual. Don't get me it was mutual. The, the Jewish people didn't like him because this historically was a, a group of people that uh, historians say maybe during captivity had uh, chosen to marry people outside of their of their faith, and that was frowned upon. And so they were they were they were just looked down upon because they weren't pure Jews. Uh, the, the Samaritans had no love for the Jews either. It, it was mutual hatred, pretty well all all the way around, and and. and Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. And besides that, she's a woman. And, and in that culture, a women were not valued. They were not uh, seen as as important as they should have been seen. And so his disciples come back and they see Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman. And they're like, what? Are you kidding me? What is he doing? Jesus begins to rip down the barriers of who it was that, that, that God wanted to reach. To, to rip down those barriers. He began to, to, to pull the, the door wide open and, and make it true that whosoever will may come. For us to be a people who um, see hundreds if not thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ. Over, open to everyone even the people who don't look like us. We have this tendency to, um, to put people in groups and we say, oh, they're a bunch of, you know, they're a bunch of drug addicts. I, I'm, I'm sure Jesus didn't come for them. You know, you know they, they are, are pretty sexually promiscuous people. And as a matter of fact, their view of marriage isn't what we believe uh, God's view of marriage is. So surely God didn't come for them. That, they're Republicans, or, or they're Democrats. Surely God didn't come for them. They're undocumented. Surely God didn't come for them. The door is open wide. to see hundreds, 
thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ in our spirits, we must begin to truly believe that the door is open for whosoever will. That is that Jesus was willing to meet her where she was. We see Jesus um, meeting her at a well about noon time. And this may have not been a, a, a real busy time of the day for at the well, but the well in general would have been a, a place of activity, a place of, of community, a place where people would come together because they needed the water. And so the well was an important part. And Jesus, there were times when Jesus would go to the synagogue or, or he would go places of, of the spiritual uh, centers and he would meet people there. But there were also time after time after time we see Jesus meeting a woman at the well. We see him going to a sinner's house, Zacchaeus' house, and, and people were going, what? He, he can't go there. He, he's not allowed to go there. We, we see Jesus interacting with people in the daily marketplace. And Jesus was willing to meet them where they were. If we want to see hundreds, maybe thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ, we have to understand that we have to meet people where they are. They won't necessarily come here. We have to, to get outside our walls and to engage in our community. I, I spend a lot of time in coffee shops, intentionally. I do like coffee, don't get me wrong. I spend a lot of time in coffee shops because you don't know the number of conversations I've had with people. People I know, people I don't know. Because in that, in that, at the well, I'm able to engage in conversation. And God has called us to be a people. You have your own wells. You have your own jobs. You have your, your own places of employment. You have your own places where you go. And God has called you to meet people where they are. Next month is Missions Month. I'm excited. I hope you come. It's going to be awesome. We, we love missions at Brookhaven. And we have missionaries all around the world. Uganda. We have people in Guatemala. We have Cambodia. We have all kinds of places. And, and we understand. We understand that missions is not possible unless we actually go there. We don't expect Nathan and Jay or Titus and Jewel or any of our other missionaries to minister to, their, um, to their, that community from the comforts of their home in Marion, Indiana. There was risk for Jesus going through Samaria. There was risk. In fact, um, the historian Josephus tells about an incident in about 20 years after Jesus where the Samaritans killed a pretty large group of people in, in this region, and so there was risk, and, and our missionaries have risk, and, and we have risk. We have to be willing to take the risk, because we have, to, we have to meet people where they are. If we want to see them to come to know Jesus Christ, we're not going to be able to be comfortable. We're going to have to put ourselves out there and, and be willing to take the risk, because we love them enough that we want them to, see, to come to know Jesus Christ. One author said evangelism is telling people about Jesus. Missions involves understanding them before we tell them. And so it is our, it is our desire that we will learn to understand our culture. We will learn to understand our culture. And, and, and because we, we want to see people come to know Jesus Christ, we will be willing to engage in, in culturally relevant uh, conversations with people to help them to come to know Jesus. As I was preparing this message, um, me and God had a conversation. And this is basically the, the, uh, the way the conversation went down. Uh, he says, Tony, you talk a lot about this. You, you talk a lot to your people about seeing hundreds, if not thousands of people come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior but are you doing anything about it personally? Not, not just from the platform. What are you doing about it personally? After I told God I didn't really like his tone with me, um, that didn't fly very well. Well, it didn't fly at all. 
I took that conviction to heart. So I stand before you today with this promise. In the next 12 months, I'm going to do everything I can to make my life, not just my professional life as your pastor, but to make my personal life a life that leads people to Jesus Christ. Will you join me? Not the masses, not the 40,000. That's a big number. That's a scary number. Will you lead one with me to Jesus? Will, will, you, will you reach out and find someone you don't know? Will you go to the well and lead someone to Jesus Christ to disciple them to become a devoted follower of him? May we be a church. May we be a church that sees people come to know Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand. God, as we come to you today, we are so thankful for this time together. You have challenged us again. God, I pray that.